solar is the real deal. It's the energy source of the future and today I want to talk about how it can help Ukraine win the war and stay powerful after the war. But solar is also complicated. Conventional technologies like stoves and boilers are simple, everyone understands how to use them, but solar is a lot more nuanced and so by the end of this video my goal is to make you understand solar well enough such that you will be able to prescribe a solar solution for yourself because I don't know your lifestyle and financial situation I can tell you what exactly to buy so in order to help you I have to empower you with the knowledge necessary to design the solution yourself. So hello YouTube, I'm Michael Size and energy is a quantity. In comparison, power is a process and to understand this, think about water. A volume of water is a quantity like a liter, it's a fixed physical amount, while a flow of water like for example one liter per second is a process. Perhaps the rate at which water is traveling through a pipe or being boiled off or whatever. And just the same, energy is a quantity, we measure it in joules and it's a fixed physical amount, while power is measured in joules per second, it's a process, and it can refer to the rate at which energy is perhaps being generated or consumed or transported. One joule per second is also called a watt and 3.6 million joules are also called a kilowatt hour and these are the units which we'll be using for power and energy going forward because they are the industry standard. Watts and kilowatt hours. How are these units relevant to solar? When we're talking about photovoltaics, the main components of the system are the inverter, whose peak power is measured in kilowatts, the battery, optionally, whose capacity is measured in kilowatt hours, and the solar panels, well, they can produce different amounts of power at different levels of illumination, and there isn't really a limit per se, but for the practical purposes of designing a photovoltaic installation, the solar panels are assigned a nominal power in a unit known as kilowatts peak, which isn't rigorously defined but it just refers to the amount of power that the panels can nominally generate when the sun is supposedly at peak luminosity on this particular planet. Again not a very rigorous unit but it does make it easier to design the system because it was chosen such that on this planet you need approximately 1 kilowatt peak of solar panels for every 1 kilowatt of inverter power in order to make the best use of both components. But how much do all of these components cost? The panels themselves are actually pretty cheap nowadays but if we're looking at the full system which means the panels plus the inverter plus the labor and so on the rule of thumb is $1000 per kilowatt peak. Although for a large rooftop installation in Eastern Europe I've seen prices as low as $500 and prices in general are somewhere below a thousand nowadays again in Eastern Europe. As for the battery, well as recently as one year ago I was going around saying that batteries are not worth it but prices have dropped precipitously and today at around $300 per kilowatt hour I would almost say that the batteries are too cheap not to get, especially if you're looking for resiliency. The rule of thumb here is 4 kilowatt hours of batteries for every 1 kilowatt peak of photovoltaics. So going forward, I'm going to assume that our system comes configured like this and inclusive of the battery comes at a price of $2000 per kilowatt peak. Is this price worth it? I want to make it very clear that the answer here is yes, because later in the video I'm going to mention how solar panels could help the nation on a systemic level, but I want to make it very clear that I'm not asking anybody to make a sacrifice for the nation and I will only model examples in which the money of the customer is spent wisely. Most of the strategies in this video are good investments for anyone, even if you don't have blackouts to fear, but I will also be sharing some that can't be justified financially if your grid is reliable, they're only worth it if it's unreliable, but even those are clear close to worth it, so again I'm not going to sit here and tell you to buy a megawatt scale battery and a hectare of solar panels, I want the money to be spent wisely. 
A crucial part of this is appropriate sizing, but in order to understand sizing, we need to understand the two sides of variability. Number one, the variability in production. Obviously, solar only produces energy while the sun is shining, but with a battery, the hourly variability becomes a non-issue. And that only leaves us with seasonal variability. In Ukraine, as well as in most of Europe, the seasonal variability is terrible, because winter production is unbelievably low, not only because the days are short, but also because Europe is cloudy during these months. This is an issue, but solar is still useful in spite of it and going forward we're going to see various ways to work around this limitation and number two the variability of demand to understand this I'm going to compile a special chart with several layers of consumption in order of how likely it is for each layer of consumption to be part of your lifestyle. Layer 1 is what I call traditional electrification, like fridges and vacuum cleaners and smartphones and light bulbs, you know, the stuff that can realistically only run on electricity. If these were the only electrical appliances you had, then your electricity consumption would be about 1 kilowatt hour per person per day. Layer 2 is electric cooking. If you're looking for home electrification, nothing is easier than purchasing an induction hob or two and a standalone electric oven like I have and this will add one kilowatt hour per person per day assuming that you cook everything at home. Layers 3 and 4 are domestic hot water and these could be merged but I'm going to separate them because in layer 3 I have the sinks which in Europe with our 220 volt system can be electrified using point of use water heaters and plugging them into the regular electrical system with with no upgrade. So this is very easy and doable DIY and layer 4 is the showers which require an actual central electric water heater. Not so DIY friendly. So layer 3 will add another 1 kilowatt hour per person per day while layer 4 will add another 2 kilowatt hours per person per day. And all of these first four layers do not typically show much seasonal variability at all. And if they do it's tiny and it might even be mutually offsetting in some cases. So I'm going to put them on the chart as flat. Layers 5 and 6 are heating and cooling and layer 7 is electric vehicles and these do show seasonal variation but for the rest of the video I'm mostly going to talk about the first four layers and you'll soon understand why. So how do we square up this demand profile with this production profile? I can tell you right away that trying to cover the winter demand entirely with self-consumption is a fool's errand. First of all, I don't even think you can do it. You just don't have enough roof space and you probably don't have enough yard space either. And if you could build a system that large, you'd have to export ungodly amounts of electricity in the summer, probably wouldn't be able to sell it all, the system would become very inefficient from a financial standpoint, and nobody even has the cash to build such a monstrosity in the first place, so this kind of aspiration is in my opinion out of the question. But if paving the earth is not the right strategy then what is the right strategy? The rule of thumb that I keep arriving at in my calculations is to make sure that March and October are covered. A couple of magical things happen if you cover March and October. First of all, you're covered for your electricity needs 75% of the year and you still get something for the other 25% and this is great. You're immune from blackouts for 75% of the year and you're more resilient against blackouts the rest of the time and the system is not crazily oversized, meaning that it's still easily profitable for you but there's more. This setup also means that in the summer you have a surplus which you could export to the grid but you could also get air conditioning and the surplus is going to be more than enough to run the AC. Nowadays most ACs are reversible so if you happen to get an AC as a result of this you're also getting a heat pump for free so keep that in mind because there's more. Now this is a bit of a finer point but the different electrification solutions have different efficiencies so for instance the electric water heater uses one kilowatt hour of electricity to do a job where the gas water heater would use no more than 1.3 kilowatt hours of gas. The induction hob uses 1 kilowatt hour of electricity to replace no more than about 
2 kilowatt hours of gas, while a heat pump uses 1 kilowatt hour of electricity to replace anywhere between 3 and 6 kilowatt hours of gas. So as you go into the winter and electricity gets more scarce, you can maximize your profitability by switching back to combustion in this order progressively as your electricity output falls. So first you switch back to gas for hot water, then you switch back to gas for cooking and only then do you switch back to gas for heating. I'm calling this magical because with this kind of a setup you probably have enough electricity in the winter to cover your layer 1 demand, but you're achieving this without crazily oversizing your system because you still have ways to make use of almost all of your summer electricity and your level of energy independence in this scenario is very high compared to the amount of investment. Now this does mean that you need to have multiple systems installed in parallel, which is a bit funky but totally doable. I mean, I have my induction hob sitting on my gas stove and I can switch back to gas at any time and you could have the electric water heater right next to the gas water heater with a few simple valves to switch between them. It's a bit of an odd lifestyle but with a very good reason for it. So let's go ahead and complete this picture and make it an actual working example. A family of three living in a a detached home in Ukraine. They invest $100 into electric cooking and $900 into a large high quality electric water heater, large enough to be used as a battery of sorts, bringing them up to a layer 4 level of electrification according to my chart. Their electricity consumption is now 5 kilowatt hours per person per day or 15 kilowatt hours per day in total, so they get a 6 kilowatt inverter with 6 kilowatt peak of solar panel panels, which is about 12 panels, and if they paired this with a 24 kilowatt hour battery, that would cost $12,000 for the system. Now, 24 kilowatt hours of battery sounds excessive, especially when 60% of your consumption is coming from hot water, because again, the heater can be programmed to heat during the day, acting as its own battery. So perhaps they cut this down to 14 kilowatt hours, saving $3,000, and put $1,000 of that towards a high power reversible mini split selected such that it has high efficiency when running in heating mode. The cooling mode efficiency does doesn't really matter since they'll be cooling on free electricity anyway. This is a great system, it has high resiliency, high optionality, it does all of this without crazy amounts of spending, but still I have to ask, is this affordable? $12,000 is a lot of money and it will be difficult for the average earner in Ukraine to come up with such an amount, but that's not necessarily a showstopper. For example, if this is affordable to the top 10% richest households, that's still a million households at least. For comparison, 60,000 new cars were sold in Ukraine last year and $12,000 is about half the price of a new car or even less. And for solar, financing is usually a lot easier as well because it should be possible to get a loan that has a lower yearly payment than the amount which you're saving on your gas and electricity bills. So if tens of thousands can afford a new car, I would guess that hundreds of thousands can afford a system like this. A couple more calculations just to get a sense of scale on the finances. It would take 7% of Ukraine's entire GDP to equip 1 million homes with this amount of solar in one year. I doubt you can do 7%, although with financing maybe, but you almost certainly can do 0.7% and adding 1.2 gigawatts of solar to the grid in a year is nothing to scoff at. Another calculation, Ukraine's currency reserves could pay for 3.5 million such installations, so if Ukrainians did in fact decide to invest 7% and people got 1 million homes equipped next year for a massive 12 gigawatts, the trade balance would be able to support this investment. But what if you live in an apartment and still want to participate in this? Here's example number two. A family of two people, grandma and grandpa, living in rural Ukraine. Their electricity use is at layer one and they don't intend to change their lifestyle, so they need about one kilowatt peak of solar panels. Unfortunately, you can't really get inverters under 3 kilowatts, 
and because the panels are the cheapest components it doesn't make sense to undersize the panels if you're buying a 3 kilowatt inverter anyway so grandma gets 3 kilowatt peak of solar panels and a 4 kilowatt hour battery for a total of 3.6 thousand dollars now because her system is oversized in the summer she exports her surplus to the grid and gets money in exchange and also because her system is oversized it means that grandma has her layer one needs covered for basically the whole year grandma is immune to blackouts so what i'm saying is that if you live in an apartment and can't get solar for yourself consider getting solar for your grandma in the countryside instead and i'm sure you can figure out how you split the finances on a systemic level if you can imagine what would happen if every countryside grandma in ukraine had a solar installation like this and they were all exporting to the grid this could cover a large percentage of the electricity demand in ukrainian cities for most of the year the city getting its electricity from the countryside and this would mean that you no longer have a central soft target for the terrorist attacks anymore because there isn't a singular power plant that's providing hundreds of megawatts it's millions and millions of distributed installations and if one goes down there's just two kilowatts of course you should also never feel obligated to export to the grid never forget that simply removing your own demand from the grid already helps the nation by itself now this video is getting quite long so i'll only squeeze in two more items if you have very little money and still want to get solar the best way to maximize your return on invested capital is to size your system such that you never have overproduction so basically to undersize your system to make sure that every single kilowatt hour of electricity which you produce is going directly towards displacing normal electricity bills and if you have lots of money you should consider adding in a micro code generation system and i'll put a text explanation of what this means on screen right now because this is going to maximize your resiliency while also maximizing efficiency solar is the future and now you know how to build it go out there and build the future thank you for watching like and subscribe